ela tá. Okay. So, so good morning everyone. Uh, it's it's really nice to be here for the second time in a month to to begin an event in English and to I, I think this this is symbolizes the international internationalization of our law school uh, I was here uh, a month ago presenting my own book in English and uh, with professor Mortimer Sellers from the from the United States and today we have professor Alan Uzelac from Croatia uh, uh, who generously came here uh, only to this engagement, uh, he was actually going to Espírito Santo. Uh, he was invited uh, by Hermes Anetti Jr., our friend, and which is the one uh, we have to thank uh, for the uh, whole organization of this main event with Alan here. And uh, Alan, editor, uh, Alan Uzelach is one of the greatest references uh, of or legal references in, Cro in Croatia is also uh, the leading civil procedure scholar in Croatia, and he's also uh, one of the leading legal uh, civil procedure scholars in Europe. He's involved with, with many international uh, legal endeavors uh, regarding civil procedure. Uh, he's working in projects of comparative law with many um, European countries. He's working with uh, the European Union uh, in many engagements regarding. He was uh, and uh, every time we meet, he he's, he has something new to tell. He was telling right now, uh, Renata, that he's also working uh, with legal aid and the analysis of uh, legal aid structures in Europe. So uh, uh, I I am Alan. Really, really glad to have you here. I also would like to thank Fernando Jaime, our former dean of the law school or one of our uh, professors, civil procedure professors here, and also Renata, uh, who took their time to be here. Um, and it's, it's a pleasure to, to host this event and to, uh, can, to, to uh, debate and to discuss with Alan and, and with you uh, uh, such uh, an important and a dear, endearing topic for us, which is judicial independence. Uh, judicial independence is the topic of the World Congress of the International Association of Procedural Law this September. Alan is also one of the main speaker at that uh, Congress, uh, of which I am going to participate as well. So we're going to meet again in September. And in Peru, yeah. in Peru. so I have already invited all the students to go. So we're trying to, to, to date. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. invite is just an euphemism mm -hmm. to say make them go, so they must go. And so uh, we are going to, and this is a topic that is important for us here in Brazil. Uh, we, have, we have had many uh, uh, difficulties with the Supreme Court and many uh, discu discussions uh, about the, the limits of the uh, Supreme, Supreme Court and what should we do with the, the, this complex issue that is judicial independence and accountability. We have to have a judiciary that is independent, but also is accountable. So where is the middle ground where we can find the, the tipping point? This is the question that Alan is going to present for us today. And it's a very uh, important question in Europe as well, I think, because of uh, I, I, Poland and uh, Hungary comes to mind, but there are many uh, instances, I'm sure, where this is also a uh, um, complex and problematic issue in Europe as well. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I invite you to, uh, to take advantage of this opportunity to speak, to ask questions after Alan finish, finishes his presentation. So let's... Um, make the most of this exceptional event. So Alan, again, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Uh, you can uh, be the, our guest and thank you, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Edelson. This is really a pleasure and honor to be uh, here uh, with you. I already said that uh, for me, Coming to Brazil is always a special opportunity to uh, discuss 
uh, the topical issues in comparative civil procedure. And the reason for that is primarily that uh, Brazil is now one of the most vibrant uh, uh, academic communities in the area of procedural law. Let me just uh, get reminded of uh, my last visit uh, uh, to Brazil where I was also having the opportunity to uh, participate in an event organized by Professor Edelson Vitorelli in Campinas and that was uh, uh, yet another opportunity to show uh, how uh, topical issues, important discussions are being organized uh, 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 here. And it's not so an, an understatement. Uh, uh, working internationally, I really have an opportunity to visit different places, but among them all Brazil is uh, one of the, uh, the venues, well actually a number of big venues, and good colleagues who really have uh, globally uh, contributed to the uh, improvement and discussions about a civil procedure. And uh, I think that uh, in a few years, all of you, if not now, or maybe already now, but you will be aware that you have a wonderful leader and host, because Edelson has been so instrumental in comparative um, uh, civil procedure. Um, I think uh, among uh, uh, all of those who I know in Brazil, he is one of the most agile, and uh, uh, you can really be uh, glad and privileged to work with him. And um, yeah, speaking about, if can you, if the if the streamers are okay. online, will work for them as well. But it's it's a kind of a challenge of the new hybrid uh, era. I would so far concentrate on you as my principal audience, but. Um, for the others, I hope uh, it's also going to be a little bit useful. But let me now get to the point. Uh, uh, I've prepared a series of uh, lectures uh, for my visit to Brazil. This time I'm going to be also uh, delivering a number of lectures in Vitoria. Uh, and uh, at last I'm going to to, Werge, uh, to to Rio, where I'm going to also uh, deliver a guest lecture. And I offer to Edelson uh, so to say, a span of possible issues. And he said that you would like to hear about judicial independence. That was the, that was the selection. So what I wanted to uh, do for you today is um, corresponding to an English saying, uh, which is usually combined uh, with weddings. It is to give you something old, something new, something borrowed, and something <laughs> blue. And uh, let me in this uh, sense start with something old about judicial independence. And this is going to be also a motto of my speech today. I think also an important reminder of our history as scholars of civil procedure. Namely, uh, I'm sure you all know that there is only one global international association that deals with uh, the issues of comparative civil procedure that studies comparatively how justice systems, civil justice systems, also a little bit of administrative and criminal, but mainly civil justice system is developed uh, in the world. And um, yeah, it was established. Now we, we, we have even a little bit of uh, a debate about it. Uh, I was recently uh, discussing with the president of the association, Eduardo Alteza, who uh, has undertaken research and he says that the association originated in 1920s actually in Latin America. Uh, a combination of Italian and, and Argentinian scholars, but basically the person who has been most mostly uh, known for founding this association was uh, uh, Professor Mauro Capelletti fl from Florence, Italy. Uh, and um, uh, this was the time when the first uh, systematic research which was undertaken at international congresses started to uh, take place. And he also introduced among the topics, or one of the principal topics that he was dealing with was access to justice, a whole series of books devoted to access to justice. But another important topic he started to uh, put in the forefront is independence of judiciary. 
And uh, here um, I've just copied a text of uh, one of his uh, 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 reports. He was a general reporter at the uh, inter uh, 11th International Congress, uh, which of, at that time it was not still not the IIPL, but the Academy of Comparative Law that was held in Caracas in 1982. That, that was uh, exactly 40 years ago. And for that Congress, uh, he said that they collected 28 national reports from all over the world on the topic of uh, judicial uh, independence. And based on that, he featured his now classical text, Who Watches the Watchman, or in Latin, known as Quis Custodiet Ipsos uh, Custodes. And uh, uh, yes, this can probably be the best uh, starting point for discussion about the intricate uh, relationship that exists between independence and accountability of judiciary. So this was something old, 40 years from now. And now, yeah, what has changed? Here is something new, and when I say something new, I would say something rather new because uh, it is an ongoing situation which has a lot to do with judicial independence, especially the side of judicial independence. And I'm sure that you have been following the events uh, th that are happening right now in Israel where the government led by a indicted prime minister started to seriously contemplate how to do a overhaul of the judicial system in which uh, the Supreme Court and its decision would be something that could be um, undone, abolished by the simple majority of the uh, votes in the parliament, and where also the uh, parliament, in which of course the prime minister has the majority, would have much stronger say, basically determine the appointment of uh, judges in the Supreme Court. And what was the reaction in Israel? Well, you see a little bit of that on this slide. I mean, you, you have been probably seeing videos on YouTube. And just to note that uh, it is now being described as the biggest political crisis in Israel since the establishment of that country. By the way, well, this weekend, you know that well, Pascha, Easter holidays, important holiday period, there were also massive demonstrations against the government and its plan to uh, undertake judicial reform in Israel. That was happening 14th week in a row. And this is probably a crisis which can uh, put an end to the rule of the uh, current uh, government in Israel. But we will see, this, it's, it's definitely something that is, that is in uh, uh, making, a history is in making uh, here. But let's move a little bit away from Israel and uh, let's go a little bit northern, another uh, Mediterranean country, because Israel is on the coast of the Mediterranean, but uh, uh, another small country uh, in Europe is Albania. Have you heard about Albania? I guess you have. We also have Kosovo, where Albanians live. That's a part of my former state, Yugoslavia. Uh, but Albania is interesting because it is a country which has also relatively recently showed us a quite different take on judicial independence. And uh, uh, why is that so? Well, here I have copied uh, a statement by a very high European representative who was sent to uh, Albania on a mission to improve democracy and rule of law in that country, which would in turn enable that country to become closer and eventually accede to the European Union. But seemingly, independence of Albanian judiciary became 
quite an obstacle to this process. The judiciary in Albania was uh, extremely strong, but as this uh, paper says, and its title also states, it is also so independent that it uses its independent independence for the purpose of personal gain. And of course, every politician is always very beware of making generalizations. But when a diplomat, European diplomat, can give a statement saying that the whole judicial system in a foreign country is corrupt, then certainly there is something behind that statement. And by the way, it was even more than that. Um, this was happening, and this is what I, this statement which I copied here was a statement from May 2014, so roughly some nine years, nine years ago. It was when it was realized that practically no judge in Albania live according to his uh, financial uh, abilities, that most of the judges have uh, um, privately at least five houses, uh, three cars, sometimes distributed among the members of uh, their families. And uh, th the whole uh, system has been showing to work in a way that, that the society as such was very well aware, even the professionals in the system were very well aware that without uh, corruption, uh, it would have not been possible and that the situation is completely unbearable. And uh, well, this political statement was just uh, one of, in the series of uh, findings that something dramatic has to be done. And indeed, well, it was um, done. Uh, it was starting it, uh, two t in 2017, uh, and that uh, dramatic process in Albania was called the vetting of judges. I don't know if you know the notion of the uh, notion of vetting. I think uh, in Trump's era, the notion of vetting became rather, rather popular. So maybe we all know that this is a comprehensive uh, screening of people in power in positions of power, and. Well, this was the first ever case where basically the political institutions that were so much behind the concept of judicial independence and the rule of law and democracy being the Council of Europe and the European Union agreed that such a process is indispensable. And then, however, they also agreed that there should be a number of important uh, uh, checks and balances in, in that process, uh, uh, measures which would secure that this process is uh, not uh, going um, in an arbitrary manner. And very interestingly, Albania is the country that had to change its constitution to enable the vetting, also inserting in agreement with the European Union that the role of international community and the European Commission will be a part of the constitutional order of, of, of Albania. The three pillars of this vetting process uh, that were designed uh, were checking of assets. So what is the property owned by, by judges? To check their background. Uh, see what, what kind of ethical and other uh, complaints were launched and what cases were uh, suspect, and also proficiency. But in the context of proficiency, there was a lot of uh, also, um, say, criminal investigations about the connection of, of judges in Albania and the organized crime and how much they, they are actually in line with, uh, with local uh, uh, ma mafia. And, uh, it was also agreed that the process of vetting would be a timely limited process, that it would last for five years, 
that the process of vetting would be transparent, that it would have several layers of specially established commissions, some of them being controlled by the international observers. And within the uh, five years uh, process, uh, uh, the judges would either be cleared or would be requested to move or would be discharged from, from their judicial uh, positions. In the beginning, um, it was an estimate that uh, about 40% um, of uh, judges would not pass the vetting process. Now, it is clear that it has been underestimated. So it's already now over, and in 2020 it was 40%, and now it seems that it will be closer to uh, between 75 and 85% uh, of, of, of judges. And um, uh, it is also very recently, uh, it was decided to uh, continue and extend the mandate of these, con uh, these commissions for additional year until the end of 2024 because the process was going sl slower than uh, expected. In any case, well, you, you see here some, some figures in the very beginning. Uh, uh, well, it was a combination of voluntary resignations and dismissals. Uh, the 170 magistrates were dismissed from office, 62 resigned, 105 were confirmed in, in, in one of the, the waves of, of the uh, vetting. And, and the usual reasons um, uh, for removal of judges was, well, above all, the inaccurate disclosure of assets, also lack of legitimate financial resources which would justify such assets while well, you live on a salary of 500 euros, maybe 1,000 in higher ranks, and, and you possess a villa on the Côte d'Azur, well, with a boat, nice um, yeah, swimming pools and, and stuff, stuff like that. Uh, also, hiding of wealth, because a lot of uh, judges had um, um, well, minor children who were very rich. Uh, they, 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 and, and, and had uh, well a whole series of current and former wives who were uh, owning uh, quite some, quite some assets. You know, Albania is uh, a little bit uh, of a Mediterranean country in extreme. It has, uh, so to say, a tribal structure of consciousness, uh, um, kind of close a little bit to south of. Uh, Italy, Calabria, or, or, or Sicily. So, it, but uh, interestingly, in, in Italy, you, you could actually distinguish who is uh, uh, belonging to Cosa Nostra and who is belonging to judiciary. In Albania, it was a little bit more difficult uh, than that. But of course, um, this is something very uh, difficult uh, because we speak about uh, people of high standing, and above all, we speak about uh, hierarchy and. Uh, in the very tops of hierarchy, the uh, prosecutors, uh, the uh, Supreme Court judges, Constitutional Court judges were also part of this uh, problem. And of course, they were, um, some of them, very proficient in, in uh, defending their position. So there was also a leading case launched in front of the European Court of uh, Human Rights, uh, where a high judge objected uh, on the um, grounds of rule of law considerations and the fair trial uh, principles, her removal from office. She was not sent to jail, she was just re removed from a high judicial office. And really in a unique case for Albania, the European Court of Human Rights, who made a lot of different decisions, this time it, the court said this is all right. There were various securities in place, the procedure was transparent, it was undertaken as such, and we cannot say that this is something that violates, on the contrary, it even reinforces judicial uh, independence. That case is known under the name, you have it here, Jojai, this XH is pronounced J, so Jojai versus Albania, and the case has been uh, decided in May 2021. So it's also a fairly uh, uh, recent case which established that there was no violation of uh, rule of law 
standards. The court also pointed that the situation in Albania is very specific and that this is a sui generis case because it really is a case where you can say harsh time require harsh uh, measures. And yeah, well, it's not always uh, like that in Europe. Uh, Edelson has already uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but before that, uh, just, to, just to note one thing about Albania, uh, this process is still going on. Uh, the most uh, current problem that, that, that Albania experiences in this process is that uh, when the appointment of judges became um, so controlled, transparent, and subject to a number of checks, you don't have any more people who are willing to work in Albanian judiciary. Because mm -hmm. also in the minds of people, that was a job where you could earn on the side. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now it's really difficult to fill in the vacant, vacant spaces in, in Albanian, uh, Albanian judiciary. But uh, as I said, let's move a little bit uh, uh, further. And we are now moving <laughs> north, coming to Poland. Uh, Poland is a case of a couple of Eastern European countries in which uh, recently the governments decided to, similar like in Israel, but um, on a bit different uh, basis, to undertake a political reshuffling and control of their uh, judiciary. And what happened in uh, Poland, well, in spring 2000, and at 20, there were for the first time big demonstrations of judges on the street. What you see there is judges marching in their robes, protesting just like, well, let's say rail, railroad workers. I don't know, who likes to strike in, in Brazil? Yeah, like railroad workers. Yeah, like yeah, okay. So here the judges were on the streets and uh, they were protesting the so-called muzzle law. Muzzle is what you have on, on the nose of that dog, and it was called the muzzle law uh, because this uh, law uh, provided that disciplinary proceeding can be initiated and uh, the disciplinary chamber can impose sanctions in the form of salary cuts uh, if the judges would um, criticize judicial reforms and some other issues undertaken by the government. And um, they could also be punished for questioning the legitimacy of judges which are appointed politically, especially to the constitutional court. Uh, and uh, these political appointments were under the very uh, strong and stringent control of the ruling party, which is current ruling party in Poland. It's PiS uh, and, and, and um, uh, uh, it's very, uh, ironical that the translation of the PiS party, Pravda i Sprawiedliwość uh, in Poland is uh, law and justice. So the law and justice party is undertaking all of uh, such uh, reforms which are very fundamentally affecting uh, uh, judicial independence. Uh, similar case we can find only also in Hungary, but I'm not going to, to speak about Hungary uh, perhaps you have heard more about Hungary. Why? Well, because uh, unlike in relationship to Poland, where Polish government is now, in spite of all of these measures against uh, judges, uh, still very popular because it is helping the war in Ukraine on the side of the allies. Well, Hungary, which was a more reserved country now, is under sanction, uh, sanctions of the European Union in the context of its judicial policies. So, so basically, as a law professor, I recently got a uh, notification from my university. Be careful when you plan uh, international uh, pro European projects uh, because you cannot ask for European funds if you have a partner in Hungary. But of course, in Poland, it's, it's, it's still, it's still, okay. still okay. It's okay, yeah. But um, uh, of course, what we also need to know is that, uh, well, to, to remind ourselves of uh, uh, 
Tolstoy and Anna, Anna Karenina. Well, all successful marriages look the same, but uh, uh, all unsuccessful marriages uh, are unhappy in their own particular way. So even in, um, in Europe, even in Hungary and in Poland, you could find comprehensive reasons which would speak in favor of improving the judiciary, in favor of changing the system. The question is only how to do it in order not to uh, create adverse uh, results. And to speak how different our societal marriages with our judiciaries are, I will show, show you a couple of um, uh, charts. So let me start with, with the first chart, uh, chart which shows the answers in different countries of the European Union. So you, here you have all the countries of the European Union uh, within a rather comprehensive uh, public uh, survey under the cap of so-called Eurobarometer. Yeah, I know you also have a Latino barometer. Yeah. It's, it's a statistical survey of institutions. And one of the questions of Eurobarometer was, um, uh, how would you like? How would you rate the justice system in particular country, in your country, in terms of the independence of courts and uh, judges? Would you say it is very good, fairly good, fairly bad, or very bad? And uh, well, what you see here in yellow are the responses that uh, uh, point to. Uh, positive assessment of judiciaries, meaning good or very good. And this is uh, one of the latest, so in the year 2021, uh, uh, basically the highest result was in Austria. 84% rated judiciaries as uh, good or very good. The lowest result was in my country, in Croatia. It was 17%. And I have also copied uh, a particular result for Croatia in comparison with the uh, European um, average, as you can see it here uh, in the right corner, showing uh, uh, that, uh, well, the, the average uh, for uh, Europe is uh, 25, which is also not, not, not a lot, but when it, when it comes to, to Croatia, only 4% uh, uh, of people said that they rate judiciary's independence as um, uh, very good and 13 as uh, uh, fairly good, whereas even 43 people rated it very bad. And just to put this also in a timely perspective, the next slide has a similar uh, uh, line of examination. This, this is the Eurobarometer's findings for, diff for several years. So the years are between 2016 to 2019. So, and the lines go one, one by one. What you can see is the trend. And uh, you can see that the trend is uh, different in uh, uh, several uh, countries. Uh, in some countries, for instance, you might be interested in about, about Portugal. You can see that uh, situation was uh, mostly improving and some it was uh, stagnating. Fortunately, in my, in my country, it was uh, deteriorating. But let me also uh, point your attention to another interesting fact. Well, the blue, this, this, this blue stack is good or very good. The red one is uh, uh, bad or very bad. And here are the countries which have more positive than negative uh, impression of the, the, their judiciaries. And here are the countries where it is below 50 percent. And now take a look at the countries and see if there is anything in common. 
the countries where we, which are on the high side are here, Denmark, Denmark, Finland, Austria, Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, uh, Luxembourg, United Kingdom, uh, and uh, France. Here on this side, what we have is Croatia, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Spain, Italy, Poland, uh, Portugal, uh, Slovenia, Romania, Portugal, Hungary, Lithuania, Czech Republic, and Estonia. Isn't it beautiful how sometimes statistics just group and reveal things? What is being revealed? Countries of the Eastern Europe and also Southern Europe from many countries, our role models, Italy, for instance, Portugal, they score fairly bad. So the public confidence in judiciary there is, is, rather, is rather low. And um, well, of course, it's not up to me to judge about things that I don't know enough, but I will just show you how it looks in Latin America according to Latino Barometro, at least some, some information that I was able to, to discern. It is about uh, the, again, very similar question. And I, I, must, I must give a footnote here. It's not the same question for one reason. In European Union, you are not allowed to ask people how much they trust their judiciary because the European U Union is based on a doctrine, you can say a dogma of mutual trust. And asking about the trust in judiciary would be, well, a little bit uh, politically, um, well, I would say um, it could compromise the, the ones who ask such a question because uh, it would show that the dogma is actually something that in reality does not, does not function because we have such huge, but basically when people are asked, do you trust the independence of your judiciary? You ask how much trust you have in judiciary. And this trust in judiciary is basically the question that was also asked in uh, Latin America. And uh, here, what you can see on, on this slide, I'm, I'm sorry if it's, it's relatively small, but you can see that first in the general survey of who you trust the most in, Latin America, the, the, the trust was placed in uh, La Iglesia, Las Fuerzas Armadas, I think it's the army and, 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 the, and the church, and then the police, and then the presidency, electoral institutions, government, and the government and judiciary are approximately here in the, in the same uh, space. It's about 27% to 25% for for uh, judicial power. The lower trust is only in, in, in enjoyed by political parties and the, and the Congress. But th these are all statistical averages. If you take a look at the countries individually, you can see that, for instance, Brazil is relatively faring uh, well. It has 36%, well, it's still below 50%, but 36% is much better than, for instance, I don't know, 13% in Paraguay. Uh, well, even Argentina, Chile, and Peru have a rather low public uh, trust and confidence. And maybe things have changed, but my experience is that such uh, uh, changes are not happening uh, uh, frequently. It's important to see the trend, so I think it's still indicative, uh, but it would, of course, uh, be worth uh, trying to see how things look right now. Uh, and I'm adding, um, just as a matter of, of comparison, the, the United States uh, judiciary and some um, data that I, that I could find on the trust in the different institutions in uh, judicial power, executive and legislative power, uh, United States is very different. Uh, now one of the principal uh, words that you are hearing in comparative congresses about is the American exceptionalism. Cause it, and one of the exceptional things in, in, in the United States is their usual massive distrust in government and their usual replacement of uh, public instruments 
uh, so say uh, executive power, instruments, agencies, uh, uh, federal um, authorities with private enforcement, which places a much stronger political role on judiciary and uh, basically this is something that, that roots on the idea that it is better to leave judges rule the society than to leave politicians in, in Washington rule the society. Once upon a time it was of course true. What you can see here is the judicial power in the United States enjoyed uh, back in 99, 80% of uh, uh, trust uh, of American public. Uh, and on, on the other hand side, well, the trust was also not very low for the executive and legislative power. However, what was happening during 2000s was first of all a decay of trust in the executive and legislative power, but also a lowering of the trust in judiciary as such. And I would bet that, well, I only got this slide up to 2015, but after Trump's mandate and what has been done to the Supreme Court, I think this figure of 53% is going to drop below 50 significantly, since the judiciary got so politicized also in the United States. So what we are going to face is also a massive uh, problem of uh, trust in judiciary in the country that has actually sold the concept of uh, judicial uh, independence. So now we need to, well, get a little bit, uh, well, you don't see everything on the slide, that doesn't mean, uh, to see uh, how to get from the political ideal, and political ideal is uh, rule of law, independent and efficient judiciary, something that is now a part of the uh, negotiation process for the future members of the European Union as a political association. Now we have also in the region to which I belong such processes in countries like Bosnia, Herzegovina, Macedonia, Serbia. Uh, of course it's uh, relevant uh, uh, for the others, uh, for the Caucasian countries, uh, Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine. Very interestingly speaking about Ukraine, a country which cannot possibly establish any form of rule of law is, is now being in lines, which means that, well, there are always political flexibilities. But basically, well, how to actually implement this political ideal in a way which will be functional and which will create not only judiciary that will be independent, but the judiciary which will be trusted by the people and which will work appropriately for these causes. And this is now basically the dilemma that we face. Well, this is the dilemma which we can say is uh, showing that we are uh, between a rock and a hard place, you know, Sila and Haribda. On one hand side, we need to uh, uh, see how to make sure that independent judiciary does not become unaccountable on the other hand, well, we have something equally undesirable, and that is the picture of a dependent and politicized uh, uh, judiciary. And therefore, the question which I'm asking is how to ensure accountability uh, and independence of judges? The how can you ensure that independent judges are accountable? Uh, for that purpose, we can ask several questions. Well, what methods we may use and what methods we may not use when we try to secure accountability? Second, how to secure public confidence and especially public participation? Do we need publicity? And if yes, how do we open justice to the public? And one step further, we have the notion of transparency. It's not just being open, it's being transparent, it's going a little bit further than that. And whether we need it, transparency in order to assure accountability. And what is the relationship between the transparency and independence? Is transparency hurting or helping independence of the judiciary? And let me hear emphasize one thing, and this is that uh, the uh, 
most important procedural right enshrined in different constitutions um, in uh, UN Charter of Human Rights, also in regional conventions, European Convention on Human Rights in Article 6 contains this right. This is the right to a fair trial. But the right to a fair trial guarantees everyone not only a uh, uh, trial before a independent tribunal, it is also a tribunal which needs to be impartial. And what needs to be provided is fair and public hearing. So what I copied also here is a statement from which is more and more starting to be important. And this is that independence and accountability are not to opposed values. They actually cannot and should not work one without the other. There can be no judicial independence without the accountability of judiciary. And of course, uh, well, we mention a lot the notions of accountability and transparency but we need to know what we are talking about. And this is why in the text that I sent to you, and was also produced for the International Congress in Kobe, where I was helping um, um, our colleague, Professor Fu Yulin from Beijing, uh, who was uh, required to address it in a general report. I tried to provide her with some uh, definitions, and uh, these definitions are here. What is and should be understood as accountability, and what is and should be understood as transparency, of justice. So what is accountability? This is both individual and collective responsibility that is addressing judges, but also courts as organizational systems. And this responsibility is connected with the discharge of their functions in a way which is being perceived as honest, competent, without improper influence, free from corruption and in line with the applicable law. Uh, transparency on ju of justice is on the other hand side uh, something even broader. It is uh, uh, an ideal, it is a principle which commands that all of the constitutive element of adjudication, so everything relevant for uh, judicial accountability is not only existent, it should also be perceivable by the public. It should be publicly accessible, it should also be publicly verifiable. The only exceptions are the exceptions which uh, are dealing with some other values, so where transparency would have a disproportionately negative effect, and such uh, limitations of transparency should be permissible only to the extent strictly necessary in a democratic society. So you should never overdo with the uh, exceptions. And if we want to now put that into the language of formulas, well, unfortunately this is for some reason not, not showing on, on, on this uh, slide. Transparency is a combination of publicity and open justice. And in order to uh, secure a public trust, what we need is a combination of transparency and accountability. Now, let me go to the main methods of securing accountability and transparency in national judiciaries. And I will be relatively quick here. Um, for the accountability, to secure accountability, you first need to have a system of control in place. And usually the means of recourse ag against judgments and the hierarchical structure of judiciary is supposed to be such type of quality control. So you need to be uh, sure that well, the products of judiciary are uh, in a certain way homologized. Uh, However, it's also equally important to have the uh, good uh, system, good people in the system, and for that you need to provide uh, criteria which secure that we actually get good people in the system. So 
what we need to have our special appointment uh, criteria, but also appointment processes, uh, which guarantee that our ideal is uh, being fulfilled. And since every power corrupts, an absolute power corrupts absolutely, we need to have a control of uh, this possible corruption, which can happen even to the best of people. So there should be proceedings to uh, identify and um, sanction uh, as such uh, uh, types of behavior. And finally, well, it's not only important to work, it's also important to work efficiently and to uh, work within a collective system where everybody is fulfilling fulfilling certain minimal requirement placed on the judicial job. On the side of transparency, what can be transparency in judiciary? I think, well, the first thing that needs to be transparent are judicial decisions. And how would that be possible? Well, we need to have a full, a full public access to judgments. Sounds normal, but in very many countries you actually have only a selection or a small fraction of judicial judgments which are available. And it's, it's also not just important that it's available. It should be easily available. And now, especially in a digital society, it should be something that is a trivial matter and not requiring days and days of uh, digging. And also not uh, weeks and months of waiting because many courts uh, nowadays uh, do publish their decisions, but sometimes with a delay that makes it uh, really difficult to know what the decision was when you really need to know it. Uh, publicity of court proceedings. We have seen in the right to a fair trial that one of the elements is a public hearing. And publicity of hearings is also a system of public control and also public trust increasing procedure because you see that the justice is not only done, it is manifestly seen to be done in front of the eyes of, of, of people. And of course you need to see that people who uh, rule are honest. So therefore one of the systems of transparency is also the transparency of um, people who rule, who they are, who their children are, how much they earn, how much they o own, whether it, there is any type of um, suspicion about illegitimate uh, sources of the outcome. And that's another thing. And the final point which I, as an academic, like to stress very much is the availability of uh, analytical data about judiciary. To have all of those statistics which after some time are really showing the picture. You have the X-ray picture of the functioning of the system. And now, especially with ICMS systems, integral case management systems, digital systems, or online courts are being established, a byproduct of that is, of course, the analytics. But that analytics is not something that should only be accessible to the court presidents or ministries uh, or even uh, professional association, it should all be available as raw data uh, which can be checked and verified by independent researchers and independent uh, uh, scholars. Of course, it is all combined with uh, problems and um, transparent selection process of uh, people uh, uh, who want to become judges. Well, how, how to ensure it? Well, first of all, you have finished law school, so your success in law school should um, have some merit at least. But often you will find statements in practice, oh, law school is not teaching you real law. You, what, what, you, what we need are, is something uh, else. So usually you have a, a, that something else in the form of professional examination, also the professional practice. And there you also have the question of how much you have learned after the, your graduation and how to evaluate it, how to get an objective score that would um, uh, determine your success and also your appointment uh, to at least career judiciary. Peer review, well, should you be 
relying on the opinion of the others from the same profession, how to assess profession, uh, professional reputation, how to assess that somebody has appropriate judicial temperament, that he is proficient for, for a judicial job, whether there should be a specific uh, process where you, you would ch check and recheck that there is uh, a practice of interviews with candidates for judicial functions, and that is something that, that, that often, often takes uh, uh, a place. But both is also combined with some problems. Uh, it's all um, working in theory, but whether it's good in pra practice, well, first question is whether we can use a, a mathematical assessment for such a um, complex job, like, like a judicial, judicial job. Um, in Croatia, we had this, this discussion within the, the, the uh, State Judicial Council, a body which is mainly composed of judges, but which was uh, uh, often criticized for uh, bad decisions about appointments, and there was then the attempt to uh, subject uh, the discretion of the council to a rather narrow uh, scope. So the main reason need to be the uh, performance assessments, which were uh, granted by uh, uh, the indicators of, of work in the system. But then there was a, a question and also a constitutional case asking whether uh, in the end you should have uh, something additional, whether mathematical methods are good for, for a real check of the quality of candidate. In itself, this is a topic that I think we could uh, uh, discuss about very, very much. Uh, with peer review, of course, um, peer review is sometimes uh, regarded to be much better than um, just taking statistics about the past cases of, of, of judges. But, uh, well, again, who watches the watchman? If you have people who are personally interested and belong to a close elite, is that guaranteeing objectivity, especially because, uh, well, you have juridical dynasties in all of our countries. Well, once a lawyer, well, generations of lawyers are going to follow, follow later whether there are interest conflicts. And, well, what should be more important, that you get a good performance and at the interview, or that in the years before that you have been consistently better than uh, the other candidate who was excelling at the interview? Anyway, questions that we cannot really uh, uh, respond. And I will only uh, raise here another uh, two problematic uh, methods of securing transparency. The background checks, so the vetting uh, like the Albanian judges uh, were undergoing to, uh, is something that uh, raises the issues, who will then control the judges? Uh, who will check their uh, decisions, whether they were arbitrary or, or not? How to check their um, property and whether there will be judicial control of the checks of their property and how to ensure that somebody is suitable uh, for, the for the office. Again, the questions which are raised here is what procedure we should uh, use, who will control the intelligence data, especially when secret police is being involved in that, and uh, in a perverse matter, um, in a perverse manner, we are now starting to go along the idea that we trust more the secret police than courts and judges. Very interesting the how, how the sides are changing. Usually you would think that judges should control secret police. Well, now secret police starts to be in charge of controlling judges. Not completely impossible, but it needs very good procedure and check of everyone and the system of checks and balances which which you have certainly heard about is otherwise imag uh, imagined as a system where nobody has absolute control and nobody is free from, from being a question. Uh, again, asset declarations are uh, also something uh, uh, 
which raises a number of issues, how to actually declare what you, what you own. We had one politician who was uh, stating that he's actually, well, too, too busy to know what he, what he all owns. So he was just putting some indication of the ownership, but then who will then check whether the asset declarations are uh, accurate, whether you should do it uh, all the time, uh, whether it is going too much if you have this publicly uh, available, this you can see the judge has a uh, weekend home uh, in Curitiba, and uh, well the address is this and this, and uh, has several entrances, and whether you need to have the, 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 the map for entering the building. For, for some of the parties who are unhappy with the judicial work, it can be simply too tempting. So, of course, there should be some, some elements uh, that secure privacy from publicity, but we need to assess them in a very uh, thorough uh, way. Uh, let me just show you how the judicial asset declaration forms look in Croatia. Of course, it's th they are not, not uh, um, uh, easy to uh, fill in. You, you now see just, just that it's, it's a list of, of, of three pages. And uh, yeah, well, this, this animation doesn't show uh, but, but what you have to, for instance, put in is the data on immovables, the way and source of the acquisition of the immovables, data on movable property. Uh, in some context, we, we were uh, having the uh, media explore whether those who were subject to asset declaration duty had to, uh, they, which watches collection they have, which probably for this watch would not be so so interesting, but but for for some watches that are tens of thousands of dollars um, uh, in value, and we have an issue with every time, right uh, yeah, yeah. Watch, <laughs> watches is something that especially we people in the south like. Well, uh, women women like jewelry, men like uh, expensive uh, watches, but of course it becomes an, an issue uh, when when you have to declare well the paintings, nice paintings that you have in your home. Uh, very interesting stuff. Anyway, uh, it's also interesting then when the media has access to uh, such data. So for instance, um, uh, well, this is the, the evening daily in Croatia with, with the pictures of uh, judges of the Supreme Court. Uh, and there what you can see down below is how much they earn and how much uh, they earn on the site. This another interesting issue, well, whether judges should be allowed even legally to earn on the side, and it turned out that some judges uh, were earning significantly more from their side engagements, uh, holding different uh, seminars, training courses, uh, uh, also selling their articles to, to, to journals. You could say, well, why, why not? That's uh, enhancing, but then again, well, whether they were doing that because they were so, so good and brilliant or because they are officially uh, in position to have a right to be right. And this is why you, why, why you need them to, to provide, provide some, some opinion. That is something that we can also discuss about. But I think um, I talked too long and I would just like to b get back to my initial uh, um, a survey of the methods of securing accountability and transparency. And since my uh, intention is always to come and learn from my lectures, not that the others just learn from my lectures, I would like to learn from you how things are evolving now in uh, Brazil. What is going on with some of the topics that I indicated, whether we can find some elements, I already have a number of impressions from Brazil that were very useful for me uh, in some of my other, other texts about the relationship of judiciary and society. But uh, yes, I would like to hear your opinion about these issues. What should be put in the forefront? Independence, accountability, and how to do it, especially how to do it when things do not work like they, they should. Of course, 
the easiest is to have a very good uh, judicial system which is independent and then you don't change a horse that wins the race it wins the races consistently but if you don't have a system that performs well shouldn't we start with the idea that we have to change the system and not just letting the system change from within which is sometimes the idea of the corporate independence of judiciary yeah judiciary should also be self-regulating but what if self-regulation brings Albanian results who is going to jump in Luis Custodiet Ipsos Custodiet thank you very much Alan, uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I really wow! It was uh, an incredible, an incredible lecture. Uh, uh, it's it, you, you speak, uh, and you, you ended with uh, what about Brazil? But we, I believe, are thinking about Brazil all the way your presentation because everything you talked about is an issue for us in a is an is a concern and all this this uh, boxes you show here are uh, very uh, uh, problematic in some ways we have uh, I believe uh, if I can say one word about this uh, I would say that we are uh, we have advanced a lot in transparency so in, the, in your right column here we are quite uh, advanced I would say but not so much in accountability and I also would say that if we do uh, an analysis about Brazil in this regard, specifically about accountability, we would have to, to segregate the data and to talk in one instance about the, let's say, ordinary courts, and in another instance about the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court is a whole different, and maybe the Superior Court are a whole different uh, uh, idea. So uh, it was really, really interesting, and I, I'm sure everyone here has many uh, ideas. I, I think you can write at least four or five dissertations <laughs> with the ideas you, you brought to us today. So thank you very much. I don't want to talk uh, to monopolize the, the, our engagement. So I would like, first of all, for you guys to, to talk and to ask questions and to, to really take advantage of our, uh, our guest here, Professor Fernando, or as well, if you want to, to, to contribute, be, be, please feel free. And anyone who, who wants to, to ask, Please come forward because we need to, to speak at the mic because of the of the transmission. Yes. So uh -huh. uh, good morning, sorry for my accent. Uh, my curiosity is about your view about um, the power, economic power and uh, the lobby uh, over the judiciary. And here in Brazil and Latin America, the design system, the institutional design, sorry, is different from Europe. Here, the judiciary uh, constantly decides about technical questions and uh, regulatory impact uh, for, for the market. And uh, there are all, uh, Always we have here attention about quality control of the judgment and the capacity of the judge to, to decide these technical questions. And also it impacts uh, the as access to justice and fair trial. And my, my question is the, the solution for, to this problem is more experts judges like the German system or more uh, opportunities to, to publicize the judgment with participation of Mixcuri and um, people uh, from uh, civil society. Uh, uh, how we ensure uh, judicial accountability to decide technical questions uh, and not become the judgment a technocracy. We don't 
uh, eliminate the, the judged values and, and the, the uh, values from the community and constitutional. Thank you very much for a, a very interesting uh, question, which of course uh, leads us to a number of um, other considerations. Uh, as far as I understand, there are two components in, in, in your uh, question. The first one is related to special position in different countries in Brazil compared to, to Europe, for instance, when it comes to the influence and impact of powerful economic uh, uh, actors, players, lobbies, industries, uh, and so on, especially when judiciary is making uh, uh, strategically important uh, decisions. And the second is about the capability of judiciary to ascertain technical mm -hmm. issues and how to deal with that. Uh, I will uh, mainly limit my comments to the first part. Um, and I think it shows again that it is always important to, to have a full picture of a situation in a particular uh, uh, jurisdiction. In, and in composed countries, you speak about the cluster of jurisdictions, federal jurisdictions, yeah. state jurisdictions, and, and so on. Uh, if I can uh, use uh, uh, ignorant uh, generalizations, uh, my generalization about Brazil and difference to my country and some countries in Europe is um, basically um, twofold. So I, I think then that in Latin America, generally you, you have more like, uh, um, so to say, uh, powerful corporate players that, that, that are the uh, competition to, to, to state authorities. In, in Europe, it also takes place, but in Europe, state is usually the, the, the most uh, uh, important entity and also the, the political elites are uh, in control of, mainly in control of, of the uh, uh, economical players. So this is something that specifically I think for, for Latin America should be more taken into, uh, into account, especially, well, to the level that, that the monopolies create and of course then uh, you have this uh, uh, a natural relationship of legal elites with particular corporations that, that then create their own systems of value and which mm -hmm. can have a special, uh, so to say, uh, feedback on, on the uh, psychology of, uh, of judiciary. In that light, I was always impressed with, with Brazil. I would uh, expect uh, much uh, more dependence on the uh, big companies, uh, multinationals, and their interests, but it seems that Brazil is still fighting well through some independent institutions, a very special situation with public prosecutors mm -hmm. in Brazil, yeah. and also very strong political position of uh, Brazilian uh, judiciary. The practice of class actions in judiciary, uh, I think this is without precedence within civil law uh, co legal cultures. Uh, of course, it's, it is a danger because then what you need to have is a very good uh, uh, analytical uh, capacity. And there we come to, to the second part of your question, well, where, where to get this from? And of course, it raises the issue of uh, first the side players, the experts, and the, the involvement also of the um, society. It's always very n much needed especially in strategically important cases, to provide that not only one perspective is being represented, but that all perspectives are being equally, equally uh, evaluated and equally represented in the process. Whether you have it or not, I cannot really, uh, really assess, but, but this is an important element which in some countries, so mine included, are sometimes missing, especially if you speak about smaller environments uh, where you have a limited number of people who yeah. can provide useful expertise, it is quite a challenge. Yeah. But it's something that we as um, uh, social scientists and proceduralists would, would, would need to think about. Yeah. 
Uh, I would say that I, I would add that uh, it's very hard to, to generalize because we have a very specific situation. So, so for instance, uh, the criminal proceedings of the Mariana case, which was that lar large disaster, uh, are uh, now uh, in uh, taking place in a very small jurisdiction, which is Ponte Nova, it's close to Belo Horizonte, which has only two judges. So they deal with everything, and they deal with tax cases, with uh, social security cases, small claims, and then they deal with one of the largest criminal cases in Brazil. It's impossible to, to, to do this. So uh, this is a problem when you have a, large, a big case in a small jurisdiction, in, in a small venue. Uh, but uh, in big cities like Belo Horizonte, uh, you have some highly specialized judges which deals with just, for example, ban bankruptcy cases. So we have a, a, a bankruptcy court that deals only with bankruptcies. So you have a, a very specialized judge to deal with a with, uh, with uh, some cases that are really complex. And so I think we have, uh, it's difficult to generalize, but in some cases you can find in Brazil judges that are really specialists in some areas of law uh, or, or in some technical issues, uh, as Vinicius uh, very cleverly pointed out. Uh, but also, uh, in some situations, there are complex cases that are being conducted by judges which really don't know uh, or, or have to know everything. And of, of course, they don't know anything because it's impossible to know everything. So uh, this, this is really is a problem. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. It was very good and clarifying. I have a question regarding the improvement of accountability of the judiciary because it's a problem. When you think we of about accountability and the lack of democracy legitimacy by the judiciary, we think about the problems that judiciary has normally, uh, lengthy procedures, a lot of bureaucracy, but we have on the other hand another difficulty regarding the misinformation and the media coverage regarding um, big cases and cases with political rele relevance. So how we can improve the accountability of the judiciary without giving some forces to this kind of scenario that we see in different countries around the world today, which is uh, you start a new, a new type of fiscalization, we can say, is mm -hmm. uh, regarding the judges and affecting the judicial independence. I think it's a problem that we live in Brazil and we have in different countries around Europe regarding this kind of um, scenario of misinformation and the consequences of it regarding the accountability. We, we need to improve accountability for some reasons, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. we might have this consequence, this bad consequence regarding the independence. Thank you, Alexandre. It's a very nice question. Uh, let me add just one information. Uh, our former president uh, decided to make the judiciary an enemy. So he, he, he this this is the, the background of this 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 problem. Uh, he decided uh, the, the we have been discussing for many years now the problems with the uh, the in the intersection between politics and. Uh, courts. It, this is a, a discussion that's been going on for 20 years or so. But the, specifically our last president decided to do something that no one had done before. He decided that the judiciary was an enemy. So he started to constantly talking about the problems of the judiciary and the, the rulings and the court was wrong and the court is doing this or that. And th so this became a problem. Are we really trying to control, to, to make the judiciary accountable? Is, is this really the goal? Or are we trying to make the judiciary do what we want it to do? So, so Yeah, um, of course, this is a um, uh, crucial question in modern uh, democracies. And let me start with what you uh, also stated in the very beginning. You said, well, judiciary has the issue with 
democratic legitimacy. Of course, we can say uh, not every judiciary has uh, th this issue. In some uh, countries, uh, well, some states in the United States, judges are being elected at the local elections. Mm -hmm. It's not something that we should strive at, I, I, I guess, but these judges do have democratic legitimacy. But for, for most judges nowadays, you actually have, and, and we need to uh, admit that openly, there is a lack of democratic legitimacy. But it is along the line of um, a famous statement that judiciary is the most fragile uh, branch of government. It doesn't have a purse, it doesn't have a sword. What it has is a pencil, and it's the force and the judiciary enjoys is in the authority and the persuasiveness of uh, judicial decisions. But we need to add now, not only that decisions are being made and that they're being phrased by lawyers, but that they do produce uh, uh, adequate social results, that they do actually come in a proper moment, that they're, that they're also coming with uh, affordable costs, but being done on the basis of, of, of the full assessment of, of the case. So it's very, it's very, very difficult. And uh, of course, uh, it is a part of the failures of um, modern civilization, if, if we can say so, because we have such high expectations and we, we have somehow to admit that uh, no judiciary in the world can fulfill all the expectations uh, what is placed on it. It's also being used politically because uh, as we face now the uh, challenges which may even seem insurmountable from wars to climatic changes, it's never comfortable to be in a position of power. It's always much better to have somebody else to blame for your own inability to handle the the problem, and this is why governments now like to have independent judiciary as their best enemy. Because mm -hmm. if, if you cannot fulfill your role, at least you can find someone that you will toss the hot potato to and then blame it. And probably the criticisms uh, by not only your president, our president, some other presidents have, have always been very eager. Netanyahu, well now most recently, Okay, he has a personal reason for that as well, but that's, um, that's something that, that is happening. And of course, uh, um, this blame game reflects in the media. The media would like um, to have stories. They would like to uh, uh, see, of course, bad news is selling much better than good news. Okay. Uh, so the transparency brings that, that, that sort of um, uh, problem with it. Uh, but um, in the end, I think this is not a reason to get into a uh, defensive position by the judiciary and prevent or narrow down. I think it's a good reason to channel uh, this, but also to, to speak about the necessity to uh, a change in the standards of uh, public communication in the public reporting and realizing that, uh, well, just like judiciary is not the enemy of the government, it's the, it's the media that, that, that are not the enemy of judiciary. Media is not a compact um, product. Of course, you have uh, all sorts of tabloid journals. Uh, now you have uh, social uh, media that, that, that are targeting the lowest of the low. But of course, you have uh, the more traditional and reliable public media, which offers for alliances uh, with uh, uh, the uh, reformist forces in judiciary, finding a common ground what would ensure transparency without producing negative impact. And final, final comment here is that, uh, well, uh, since these are the challenging times, this is now raising uh, the bar when it comes to the standards of people who need to uh, take the positions of power in the judiciary. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, our tradition is a tradition of 
uh, civil law, hierarchical, judiciary, to quote Merriman, what we have in our judiciaries is a series of faceless bureaucrats. Well, until we have faceless bureaucrats, it's not something that is going to cope well with, with the uh, transparency requirements. And of course, faceless bureaucrats are faceless because they want to cover their face from the audience. Yeah. You need to have strong individuals who, who have also the strong uh, opinions and motives and also reasonable uh, mind that enables to make smart decisions, especially in the higher ranks of the judiciary, this becomes uh, uh, more and more important. And in such a way, just like with every public office, you will be able to fight with uh, the inquiries coming from, from the outside world. Mm -hmm. Of course, judges, and this is uh, the final admission, we have to admit that, that uh, judges, but also lawyers have for centuries felt to be protected and overprotected and to be in the background and nobody would be daring to criticize them. Well, these times are by and gone. Yeah, uh, I, I would say, but to, I would comment on your, on your uh, speech that um, when I was a student in Brazil, um, uh, there were two kinds of students, the ones who wants to wanted to go to the private sectors and to get rich. I didn't want that. I don't like money. It's useless. Uh, and the ones who want to, to go to the public service. If you, if you, if you ask the ones uh, who wanted to go to the public service, everyone wanted to be a judge. Or, or, or maybe a prosecutor, but and that was it. No one would say, no, I don't, I don't want to be a judge. Ah, if, if someone handed it to me, I wouldn't accept. Uh, now, for the first time, I, I think you were right when you said we are raising the bar. For the first time, people who want to go to the public sector, the, those who want to go to the public sector, are thinking twice about becoming judges because it's too public, uh, it's too much responsibility, and maybe you have some other positions in the government that are going to pay the same amount, and we are going to demand much less from you personally, and so you, you may be a public lawyer, and you are going to uh, to earn as much money to to be much much less demanded, and to 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 exercise a function that you can well enjoy your weekends and vacations and and do uh, and earn exactly the same amount. So, uh, for the first time, we are seeing this kind of comparison because because judges are being uh, much more scrutinized. Mm. And, uh, and of course, there's the right type of scrutiny, and, uh, scrutiny, and, and I think uh, we should praise that, and many judges should be even more scrutinized than they are today. But when you think about, for example, the Supreme Court, uh, there's been much talk in the last few years about impeaching a justice from the Supreme Court. I would love to impeach many of them, but uh, for none of the reasons I've seen in the media, I've seen in the mouth of the politics, they are all saying uh, reasons, they are all uh, uh, publicizing reasons that shouldn't be grounds for impeachment. So this is the risk. Uh, you, you then start to, uh, to reduce uh, uh, independence uh, because you want to actually not, uh, you use the discourse of accountability just as a discourse to arrive at a point when you can reduce their independence and make them do what, whatever you want. So uh, this, this is, uh, 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 I believe, a, a very delicate uh, middle ground that we have to find, especially in Latin America, because we have a tradition of uh, institutions that are uh, very poorly uh, constructed and uh, insti very poorly institutionalized and, and uh, so on. And one other remark I would like to say, and I, I, I think you, you covered it really well, is that 
uh, at some point, uh, institutional design, Vinicius used that, that expression, institutional design is something that's very important, but at some point we, we are having, uh, we, we have to have good people in, in the, uh, pe the right people in the right positions, and this is very hard to, to ascertain, it's, it's, it's difficult to get, sometimes it's lucky, Sometimes we, we just get lucky. I think we have some justices. I, I always say this about, for example, uh, a judge we have at the Superior Court, which is Herman Benjamin. Herman was a mistake. Who put, uh, whoever put him there is, must be very uh, regretful because he's really independent. He has uh, excellent opinions, and he always is on the right side of, of the cases. Uh, he was uh, someone's mistake. I don't know who, because he... he he cheated some, some president to, to appoint him because he's too good to be there. He's too good. And uh, so sometimes we get lucky and we can put uh, good people in, in the right place. Herman Benjamin is, is one instance in which I think we, we were really lucky to, to have an excellent judge in, in, a, in a power position. Other times, and I am not going to name the, uh, these other times, we were not so lucky. And we have people who shouldn't be there and who are there. And uh, uh, another point you covered very well is that we have different uh, procedures to appoint a judge for uh, a first a f a district court, a first is an instance court, and to appoint a judge for the Supreme Court or for the Superior Court. And these uh, very different procedures, uh, we have, um, I would say, good in their own way scrutiny uh, uh, in the beginning, but nothing uh, after you, you get the position. So uh, it's, it's very hard to get in. Uh, when uh, Justice Fakin was appointed for the Supreme Court, uh, it was a, a political uh, uh, complicated moment. It, wa it was when Gilma was being impeached, and so Fakin, which is one of the best justices at the Supreme Court by far, he's m my favorite, my personal favorite. Uh, but he launched a public campaign for his confirmation because there was a political risk for him not to be confirmed by the Senate. So he, he launched a website that was called Fakin Sin. So yes, to Fakin. Uh, uh, and this, this was his uh, way of, of getting through the confirmation process. So confirmation processes uh, are, can be difficult if uh, they come by in a politically uh, difficult time. But, um, and of course, in for judges uh, at the first insta instance courts, we have public examinations which are highly, highly, highly uh, competitive, and so good people get in, but the problem I think we have in Brazil is, what about later, after you have gotten in? Uh, what's, what are the, the uh, we concretely don't have any mechanism to evaluate the quality of the work of a judge. We have mechanism to, to um, find instances of corruption and to investigate corruption and uh, cases, se very serious cases, but to evaluate performance, we don't have anything, I would say. So this, this is complicated. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was brilliant. And <coughs> I would like to provoke you something, uh, take a ride what Edilson brought to us. Uh, supposing a hypothetical country, Passargada, mm -hmm. eh, where I can be friend of the king, mm. and the, the executive power can nominate 20% of the judges in all courts in Brazil, in Passargada. Eh, and Passargada is a candidate to, to enter in the Union, Europe, Europe Union. So uh, what will be considered in the Council of the Europe Union about this situation, that the chef, chief of the executive can nominate 20% of the judges in all courts in the country? How do you can relate this with the independence of the, the 
the judicial power? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question, but I will give you the answer that you will not like. Uh, I, I'm coming from, from a, a country which has really put so much uh, attention on the process of selection of candidates. And uh, after some time, well, kind of similar uh, like in Albania, um, it has uh, led to a situation where judicial posts are not any more attractive positions. Um, is this something that we want? Well, my personal opinion in the light of that experience is that what we have to aim at is what happens after the appointment, not before the appointment. And that we also need to aim at a particular balance in the appointments, uh, which will reflect the diversity in the society, but also diversity of skills. In the United States, well, I remember a couple of uh, uh, anecdotes about some of the best judges in the US courts, and after years of their successful career, uh, the journalist would come and ask such a judge, well, how come that you were appointed as a judge? And he said, well, I was just a lawyer who happened to know the governor, which again, actually reflects some of the practices in those countries that you have seen in, in this chart that have the most trust in their judiciaries, which is paradoxical. Of course, I would not advise uh, as, as a good strategy to give uh, a president like Bolsonaro the power to appoint uh, arbitrarily judges to the any, any type of court or any type of cooks in the restaurant or whatever, in, in, in whatever place. But when it comes to appointments to judiciary, I think in line of what you stated, uh, Edelson, we need to have judiciary as an attractive position for people of broad mind, high analytical skills, and well, good morals. And you cannot do it if you produce an over uh, complicated uh, bureaucratic system. For instance, in, in Croatia now to become a judge, you would first need to wait for years before there would be a competition and then you would need to apply and wait for years for the results and then you would just become a, a judicial intern and then you would kind of have the ongoing career. So, so those who were more ambition, ambitious and better uh, in the very beginning, well, they already gave up and because uh, they were very much sought yeah. uh, at, uh, on, on the market. So maybe we should be having headhunters for good judges. And my final remark here is that maybe we are also overemphasizing this personal element in judges, because even the best people will not do uh, right things unless they are well supported. So I think uh, uh, what we need to uh, develop is an uh, institutional structure within the courts that secures adequate support. Let's just think about uh, Supreme Court judges in the United States. Who is actually writing their judgments? Do you think that they write their, their judgments? No. Well, some of them want to nitty put a nitty gritty. Well, students appointed as their clerks are doing that job. They have the brightest and the best young minds who support them. I also visited some course also here in, in Argentina, in Brazil, in, uh, and, and, in, um, uh, and was impressed with some good teams with the judicial secretaries who were uh, supporting uh, a judge or several judges, but now you cannot imagine to have an important social institution if it doesn't really have a strong team spirit and team work behind it. Judge is a leader, but you need to also have a strong uh, institution that will help this um, leadership evolve into a reasonable decision making without arbitrariness. So 
judges become now more at a higher level in successful systems, uh, uh, as porte paroles, they are, they are the faces that would need to endure, of course, also the public scrutiny. Mm -hmm. But the whole system should be staying uh, behind them. At the same time, maintaining individual responsibility. Yeah. The, the fact that uh, your clerk is writing your decision in an important case doesn't mean that you are off the hook. It's your decision. But that helps you to do, to make a right decision because you have a limited set of options uh, because good people who do research are those who offer you these options. If you don't have this, you're going to write your decisions just like some of my fellow judges in Croatia. You read what the newspapers write about how it should be decided and then they put in the, the journalists' uh, uh, thoughts into the, the decisions that are being produced, which is equally uh, harmful uh, as, as arbitrariness. Mm -hmm. Gabriela can ask 10 questions. <laughs> I would like also to thank you, Gabriela, now publicly for organizing, for, for receiving Alan. Yesterday, you were an uh, uh, invaluable part of all that's happening here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I have some considerations. I wrote them because I would like your comments about this. Um, one. One thing is about transparency. I think here in Brazil we go all over the place. I think we try everything and sometimes um, the attempts are a little bit pathetic, I, I, I can say that. Um, I was just looking on TikTok. Um, the Supreme Court has a TikTok account and an Instagram account and when I saw that I was like, that's not possible. And I think this is a so desperate try to increase the confidence in the court and it, and it doesn't work. It's just, I don't know. And the other thing that I would like you to comment is about accountability. When we say, when we see um, the media doing all sorts of, um, all sorts of comments about the judges, especially Supreme Courts, um, we see it's very personal. It's not about their decisions. It's really about the character. And I, I think you can have this, not only in Brazil, I remembered uh, Ruth Ginsburg, RBG, uh, on US, and I was like, okay, that was, uh, personally, I, I like her because she made the decisions I would, I, I would, would defend, but nobody was talking about the justification of her decisions. So I think it's, and it's a trend in this globalized world. Everybody just wants to say um, quick things about, uh, quick comments about the decisions, but never uh, about the justification of the decisions. So uh, I think that's it. <laughs> So, so when you like it, it's when you like it's a, it's a very nice ruling, it, which is uh, implementing fundamental rights. When you don't like it, it's judicial activism and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, the first uh, question is about the um, communication policy of of, of judiciary. Uh, should the Supreme Court have a TikTok account? Um, well. Under American government, you would have to ban TikTok anyway, but um, I suppose you're not following that advice. Uh, um, I'm not quite sure whether TikTok is a proper place to, um, so, so to say, distribute the subtleties of, of uh, judicial decision making. Uh, I don't know whether it's a good source, but what I also have to say is that I like it more than uh, rather conservative strategies of a number of judicial institutions all over the world where basically it is self-understood as a virtue if you don't even use a computer but let your typist uh, uh, put everything inside. Well, even even in, in Austria, which has uh, ranked so high, you have a rather conservative practice that judges uh, basically uh, do not write. They dictate their decisions on, well, they used to do it to a, to a court reporter, now they do it in, 
in in the uh, recording devices that that, that they that they have. Um, I, I think judiciary needs to change and also needs to change their their uh, communication strategy. Whether it is ultimately the most important thing, it's not. It only only shows that judiciary wants to open, and this is a good sign sign that it wants to open to society. But if it's being a part of the policy that you just uh, uh, have a scam opening and then the really important stuff is not being available, then I would take this as a sign of populism in, in judiciary. Populism is now getting all over the place, so why would judiciary be, be spared from populism? We need to know how to, how to uh, uh, diagnose it and address it because, of course, this can be a part of the um, good intention, uh, but it shouldn't be a replacement for the real opening because some channels are being designed for some methods of conveying information. If you, if you want to seek the ultimate truth about the world, you don't seek it on Twitter. Wikipedia is also sometimes not a good, not a good so a sor source for that, but it's better for some sorts of information than, than, than the others. And sometimes you need to, to combine, but of course you need to think what you want to convey and how and where, and this becomes a part of this difficult life of modern judiciaries, because modern judiciaries were evolving from a system where judiciaries were basically God-given uh, bureaucratic institutions uh, with nice buildings that nobody was uh, ever interested in. Now we need to have a, a quite a dramatic change. And, um, well, I, I have uh, uh, devoted a couple of my lectures, uh, which I will have uh, later in uh, Vitoria, and, and uh, also, uh, some of them are uh, dealing with the analysis uh, and the evaluation of judicial systems, how to develop them on the basis of objective uh, criteria. The other is about the transformation of uh, uh, modern uh, judiciaries. I was also speaking about that in, in my series of lectures here on, on the future of civil procedure some years ago. Uh, but uh, speaking about technical uh, assessments in, in judiciary, I can make a little bit of uh, advertisement for a conference which we organize in Dubrovnik uh, in May, beginning June. Uh, the Public and Private Justice is the uh, series of conferences. This time the topic will be the heroes of the periphery and we will explore the role of experts and the associate judicial services in dispensing modern justice. Uh, that, that's going to be be our topic. Definitely we have a lot of things to continue our discussion about, but taking a look at my watch, I think we still have some some place for questions, so. Anyone, one, one last question, anyone? Um, we're about to have here in Brazil a uh, Supreme Court judge that uh, is going to retire. So, today actually, yes. So, our president is going to choose the new one. And everybody's saying that he might choose his former lawyer that represented, he represented him uh, in criminal cases and everything. And... Uh, this discussion always arises. Uh, what should be the, the right criteria to choose a judge at the Supreme Court? Um, first, I would like to know how it happens in Croatia and uh, how the professor think, uh, thinks that it should happen, uh, the election of a new judge for the Supreme Court. Thank you. It's a very nice question. I would add, and also, Fixed terms, life tenure. Yeah, uh, very difficult uh, question, and uh, I don't know if I have a uniform answer in, in in all instances. I just can give you some parameters for 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 uh, the answer, and you can combine them uh, later. So the first thing about uh, well, appointment of your lawyer as a judge of the Supreme Court. 
not a nice thing to do, but it has been happening uh, throughout history and uh, not always with bad, with, with bad outcome. At least when you have an appointment of the Supreme Court judge by a president, you have political accountability of the president. And you also have the public scrutiny of, 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 of the process. Uh, basically, this is how judges in the United States are, are being appointed to the Supreme Court. You have seen how uh, the process has been going uh, on in, the, in recent time, and it has become rather a partisan process, as, as, as you know, political parties, basically. And it's, it's a sad situation which shows uh, uh, the disease in the political system, because if you have a rather polarized uh, situation, uh, then you will get uh, a rather polarized appointments and it's, it's like you appoint one of your people against one of uh, 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 the other uh, side's people, but we want to have more than, than, the, other, than the other side. And it, it doesn't, create a good, doesn't create a good system. But uh, ag again, it's, it's a rather difficult uh, problem for democracy. I will just give you, you asked me about the, the creation system, I will tell you about the system in uh, our constitutional court, which is a little bit special, uh, but uh, it's, it's very um, a good uh, reply to your question, because we had um, uh, a constitutional court which was not always uh, very uh, uh, well received by the, by the public, and there was a consensus that there should be some kind of depolitization of the uh, um, constitutional court, although constitutional court is a part of the political system, it's a special special court which uh, uh, has, for instance, uh, uh, the timely mandate of the constitutional court judges, they are appointed for eight years, uh, various judges in the regular courts uh, do not have a limit, timely limited mandate, and they're also elected in the parliament and, and not being appointed as the regular court judges. But what was happening was uh, uh, that uh, the attempt to change the system of appointment uh, or election of the constitutional court judges uh, resulted in completely different results. At that time it seemed like a good idea to have a um, professional constitutional court judges who would not be members of political par parties, but would be uh, basically people who enjoy confidence from all sides. Mm -hmm. You know what we did? We changed the constitution and provided that constitutional court judge can be appointed only by the two thirds majority of the members of the parliament. You know what followed? A disaster because of course we had a political system with two, three bigger parties. And uh, as the constitutional court judges uh, retired or their mandates expired, it was not possible to come to any consensus in, in, in the parliament about any of the candidates. So we had a fewer and fewer number of constitutional court judges up to the point that there was uh, a threatening constitutional crisis because uh, there could be, uh, well, some decisions could not have been made by the constitutional court, N not enough judges in that court. And of course, well, you couldn't then ch change the constitution again because there was no consensus about what to do then. And you know what the result was? What do you do when you, when you, when you need to do such a political decision? If you would be uh, uh, the uh, president of, of the uh, main opposition party, you would be the president of the um, ruling party, what would you say? I would share the court. Of course. Yes. Let's yes. divide it. One, 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 one for me, one for you. One for me, one for you. And this is how we got a lower quality constitutional judges with stronger political pedigree something that is now happening in the United States as a super court as, as, as well, but they have such a big pool. Of course, we, we are much a smaller, sm a smaller country, so this, this hasn't uh, led to a, a good system of, of appointment. So it's very difficult. We, for instance, in the regular judiciary, have a body which is composed by the majority of judges. It has uh, 
uh, 11 members, seven are judges, two from the uh, Supreme Court, two from the appellate courts, uh, two from the first instance courts, and one from specialized uh, courts. So that is seven judges which are being elected from the electorate of judges, electorate of peers. Uh, there are two university professors and there are uh, two politicians, one from the opposition and one from the ruling party. How do you like it? You like it. Sounds well. Theoretically. Theoretically. How, do, how does it work? Complete disaster. Not just disaster, complete disaster. And I can, I can uh, testify about it because I was a member of, in one of the mandates of the State Judicial Council sitting there watching what this body, this Consiglio Superiore della Magistratura in a Croatian fashion uh, was doing and you could see the institutional shortcomings even though th there were some good people but basically, well, if you have a body with, with too many uh, authorities, uh, too many things that it does on its own and doesn't know how to do them, how to evaluate, how to do political assessment, how to undertake disciplinary proceedings. Uh, well, in the end, it produces uh, a system which is, which is not being fine-tuned to the aim. That was, uh, it's also the system which is not able to define its own perspective and function. The first day when I came there as a member of the council, I, I asked the president, could we start uh, framing a policy in the work for the next four years? And everybody laughed. What policy? Well, we, de we decide by voting, come on. Sh shall we do something else? No, we, are, we were all, uh, well, uh, benevolent and sometimes not even benevolent amateurs because at the same time, well, sitting, sitting on the council, you're working as, as a politician, as a professor, as, as, as a judge. And of course, you know that you will return there because you will be there for one mandate for four years, maximum is eight, but uh, yeah, that was uh, not, not a practice to stay, stay on the council. Even the president, uh, who was usually some of the judges of the Supreme Court, was uh, the one who would be there basically two days per week. And without a massive secretariat and a good machinery, which we didn't have, it, it was not possible to work in a way which was uh, satisfactory. So I don't think that uh, uh, this is something that we should be looking at from our usual lawyers' uh, intuitions. We have to test them. We have to include, uh, I think, um, serious um, research uh, which would include political scientists, which would include sociologists, psychologists, mm -hmm. and different sorts of uh, um, professionals and also members of the public should be um, involved in designing something that would make sense for the future. But, uh, well, on the bright side, there are very few systems that are very good in that, in our civilizations. Alan, this is a very nice remark for us to end, because nowadays we have a constitutional amendment uh, pr a pr proposed in Brazil to try to change the appointment and to establish fixed terms for Supreme Court justices here. So this is uh, a topic of the day in Brazil, and many people believe that their intuition is going to make the Supreme Court better, and maybe we can uh, end up in a disaster uh, which is worse than we, what we have today. So this is something that we, we should uh, really think about before making these bold changes, which uh, all, uh, I, I would say that, uh, I would li I like to say, uh, uh, Giovanni that is upstairs plays tennis with me, and uh, I have a, s a phrase when we play that is, everything always works w in your mind. And I think in law it's exactly the same. When you, we are playing tennis, you think about what you're going to do, and in your mind it is always going to 
perform exactly as you thought about. And I think uh, institutional designs are just like this. So you try to, uh, you think about something, oh, we are going to have justice for 12 years, and they are going to be appointed by Congress and by the academia and among judges, and it was going to be much, much better than the president's, uh, and, the pres and the president's lawyers and, and, and so on and so forth, and then we end up in a design, in, in a practical uh, move that is much, much worse than what we theoretically designed. So thank you so much for such an illuminating conference. It was really, really nice. Thank you all so much for participating and for asking questions and for being here. Uh, it was really uh, nice and I learned a lot today. Uh, I hope we can keep organizing this, these events here at our law school, uh, and I hope you can come back very soon for us to talk more about this, maybe at the court, so you can also uh, meet my, my new colleagues there. Thank you very much. Obrigado, obrigado, pessoal. Até a próxima.